So you guys are in luck, and it's not because I'm speaking, it's because it's the last talk of the day. So your death by PowerPoint is almost over here. Um, it obviously makes a lot of sense to have a Michigan Chronic Wasting Disease Symposium, have someone talk about the disease in Michigan, right? Um, so I kind of drew the short straw on that, and we'll be given a brief uh, presentation on that. Before I do that, I obviously want to recognize a lot of the staff that we have that are either directly or indirectly responsible for providing data uh, that contributed to this talk. Uh, a lot of these people might not be interested in having their name associated with chronic wasting disease, but I certainly want to acknowledge uh, their contributions towards it. Obviously, when we start talking about uh, deer in Michigan, I want to talk about sort of the overall impact and importance of deer in this state. So we have over 600,000 deer hunters in the state, and those 600,000 deer hunters contribute to over 10 million days of recreational opportunity of field during the hunting season. Of all the hunters we have in Michigan, over 80% of them hunt deer. Now, a study put out by the National Shooting Sports Foundation in 2011 uh, estimated that deer hunting alone has a $1.9 billion multiplied economic impact in the state. To put that into perspective, Overall hunting in the state has about a 2.3 billion multiplied economic impact. And then a study that came coming out of a grad student uh, recently from Michigan State University estimated that over 25 million pounds of venison are consumed by residents in Michigan each year. So I like to say that uh, deer in Michigan are kind of a big deal. I think those numbers support it. So trying to figure out where to start this talk uh, in, in this timeline in, uh, with CWD in the state, I thought it made sense to start at the beginning, because uh, that's when most timelines generally start, right? And our timeline really started in 2002. And in 2002, that's when we created our first uh, surveillance and response plan. And, and I think that's pretty consistent with a lot of Midwestern states sort of responding to the late, latest detection uh, of CWD in Wisconsin. And for a couple years, we were able to shelve that response plan uh, until CWD was identified in a captive service facility in Kent County. A couple years later, our CWD response plan was revised. Major uh, changes in that revision were basically the uh, sort of a more focused effort on uh, reducing baiting and feeding in the state rather than a peninsula-wide ban, which was implemented when we first found CWD and was, in it, and was uh, mentioned in the first response plan. 2015, things got a little bit more real. That's when we found our first uh, free-ranging deer in Ingham County. And then earlier this year in January, we found a positive animal or two positive animals that were submitted from a captive service facility in Macosta County. And then just this week, uh, we announced uh, a probable uh, suspect in Montcalm County. And I'll show you where some of these locations are here in just a minute. But going back to the response plan, it basically identifies five major responses when we, uh, when we locate a, a CWD positive animal that the agency is going to undertake uh, in response to that. And obviously one is complete a population survey, which is easier said than done. When you find a first case of CWD in a very suburban or even urbanized area, it's hard to get an, uh, a population estimate through traditional measures such as like distance sampling or aerial surveys. It's, it just isn't feasible. Uh, fortunately, we were able to rely on at least getting a, a sort of bottom line baseline estimate because of some previous work on uh, genetic relatedness that was done from uh, fecal pellet samples uh, that were collected from researchers at Michigan State. And that sort of set at least a, a bottom bar for us, a very low bar, because uh, we knew we had very high deer densities in that area. One of the primary regulatory responses is establishing a CWD management zone, and with that, a deer feeding and baiting ban. Uh, we also prohibit the movement of both private and free-ranging uh, carcasses from the CWD management zone, and then we obviously intensify our surveillance efforts. And this is done obviously through the liberalization of uh, hunting and, and hunting season, but also through the use of sharpshooting. Today, uh, just looking at the positive animals that we've identified, I mentioned the 2008 facility in Kent County. That facility was depopulated. You heard that earlier today. We did three years worth of surveillance around that area, never found any additional positives, uh, both inside that facility or outside the facility, and that, that area was basically lifted. Uh, 2015, we found a free-ranging deer uh, in Lansing. 
We've now found nine total positive deer in and around that area. And then in 2017, obviously, the captive facility in Macosta County, which the facility has been depopulated, and obviously we have surveillance going on, and a lot of that effort is going to be taken this, this winter and this fall and this winter from the hunting season. And then obviously our free-ranging deer in Montcalm County, which we're really at the beginning. But I'm going to start really talking about, and most of this talk is going to focus on our Lansing Corps, because that's really where the heart of our, our response lies. This is the overall uh, CWD zones and core areas that we've identified in the state. And like I said, the two uh, to the north in Macosta and Montcalm County are really being treated as two separate core areas. Uh, obviously, the northern one with the captive facility and the, and the southern one with the new free-ranging facility, uh, uh, the free-ranging animal that we just identified. Most of the talk, like I said, will focus on this 20 township core that's spread across about five counties in southern Michigan. And that's where the heart of our, our surveillance and efforts have gone. And that started actually in, in April of 2015 when the animal was first identified and put down. But ultimately, we received confirmation uh, in late May that the animal was CWD positive. It was, it was a six-year-old female deer. It was symptomatic. And it was put down by uh, Meridian Township Police, which obviously lies in Ingham County. And since then, we found eight additional cases. Three have come from hunter-harvested animals. Five have come from uh, our, our sharpshooters with the USDA Wildlife Services. And, and I specifically mentioned Meridian Township, and I specifically mentioned USDA Wildlife Services because they've been tremendous partners in this. Uh, they've both been on board in, in identifying CWD as a major threat to the deer herd in the state, uh, and, and we couldn't have asked for better partners. So I really certainly wanted to highlight those, those two entities. And obviously, there's the Montcalm County animal as well. Looking at spread uh, across time, you know, the first animal was found in April 2015. That was that symptomatic six-year-old doe. Our response was pretty quick and was pretty aggressive. And we employed these sharpshooters, and we typically do this within about a two-mile radius of a known positive. And we picked up another positive animal in June and another one in July of that year. But that was it for the sharpshooting effort, and then we didn't find our next positive until November 2015. Obviously, this came from a hunter harvested deer. And obviously this was disappointing because it was outside of our, our immediate uh, well-defined well area. I further got frustrated in uh, December when we found another positive animal. And this was actually a voluntary submission. This animal was submitted to us for testing outside of our mandatory check area. So we were very fortunate to find that one. Sharpshooting resumed later that winter. We found two positive uh, animals again around uh, previously existing locations. Another animal was picked up with sharpshooting uh, in August of 2016. And last, uh, last year, last hunting season, we only found one individual, but again, it was in a new location, uh, again in southern Clinton County, this time in, out in Eagle Township, which is on the west end of the county. This is our current, uh, what we call deer management unit, which is 419, which is the five county area. And then our core is that green area, uh, which we call DMU 333. Um, and this is what it looks like today based on uh, the expansion that we've seen through detections over the past couple years. But it obviously didn't start like this. In 2015, our core was only nine townships and spread across three counties. And with the addition of those positive animals that we found up in DeWitt Township, up in Watertown Township in the core, we expanded our core to 17 townships last year, uh, and then you obviously see what it looks like today. One of the neat things about uh, the positives that we've at least been identifying so far is that they've all been related to at least one other positive animal. So this is, this is a lot. I'm going to try to walk you through it as best I can. So you've got the top half of this uh, chart, which is sort of divided by those black uh, squares in a diagonal form. It's essentially a mirror image of each other, okay? And the reason we do that is now you can go either across rows or down columns to identify individual relationships between a single animal. So with that, the initial uh, index animal, that six-year-old female doe, you can see was related to a two-year-old positive male uh, from a parent-offspring relationship, and then uh, a button buck uh, later, a couple, uh, two years later, that we identify. Now, everything in blue that you see is an animal that was taken in Ingham County 
everything in green is from Clinton County. And those Clinton County deer, if you remember, are a little bit more spread out. What's interesting about those, when you look at the relationships between the Clinton County deer, is none of them are related to one another, but they all are related back to animals that originated from Ingham County, specifically Meridian Township. So there's certainly a, a potential for movement and the influence of movement uh, that, that's facilitating the spread of this disease. Now, historically, before that first animal was identified, uh, we tested well over 34,000 deer, 1,600 elk and 70 moose in the state. None of them came back as CWD positive. And our, our active surveillance really started in 2002. We had a few samples before then. Um, but we shifted sort of our focus in 2011, focusing more on targeted animals, simply because we knew that uh, the samples that we were collecting through our active surveillance simply weren't sufficient to make any sort of determination uh, or confidence of whether the disease did exist in those certain areas. Since that first animal was identified, we've tested well over 14,000 deer in the state, and we will test any deer from any hunter anywhere in the state, no questions asked on our dime. But obviously you can see most of the animals that come through are from what we call our 20 township core area right now. About half of them right now have been hunter harvested deer. That number is gonna obviously balloon coming up here soon. And we will, I fully anticipate more than half of the samples from that core uh, to be from hunter harvested deer after the hunting season concludes. But I also want to point out the sort of relative relationship between the total samples that we're getting from other areas, specifically roadkill deer, well over 2,000 deer collected just within that 20 township core. And remember where I told you how we're getting our positives, hunter harvest and sharpshooting deer, not a one of these 2,000 plus animals from roadkill have tested positive just yet. Uh, we also employ wildlife services within a very close uh, proximity to known positives. Um, and these are largely areas that are unhunted. I will point out that the number from the remainder of the state, about 3,000 animals, that has the one positive deer, which is the Montcalm County deer. Uh, we've now tested about 500 deer from that Macosta Montcalm County area. And certainly uh, that number is going to grow quite a bit, uh, certainly this year and, and probably in years to come. So when we talk about surveillance in the state of Michigan, there's really three things that we, we do. We, we, we use uh, obviously our disease, we use disease control permits. We obviously use our hunters and we use uh, our, our roadkill. And I really wanna focus on the first method here is, is our roadkill. And ultimately what we've done there is we've dedicated a specific hotline that any individual anywhere that's driving through that area can call, can text to report a roadkill in the location. And we have dedicated staff that's available uh, five days a week to pick that animal up and ultimately get it tested. Um, and I believe we have, and that's, that's year round. So if anybody's interested in a low paying job of picking up roadkill deer in July, uh, we've got the job just for you. Um, this does obviously allow opportunities uh, for collecting samples, not only year round, but areas where you don't get a lot of hunting. A lot of these urban suburban areas where you have limited access for hunters, we are able to get samples from these areas. Uh, and obviously, as you can imagine, a lot of local communities rather enjoy this service, right? Looking at the total number of road kills that have been picked up, you can see this big fat dot right there is Meridian Township. And that's where most of our animals are coming from. What's amazing about that is our wildlife services group has probably taken well over a thousand deer in two and a half years from that area. And you can see there are still probably a lot of deer there. I think we've made a dent, no doubt, but ultimately there are still a lot of deer in that area. And that's a, that's a challenge because these other red dots are the positive CWD animals. But you can see most of it is confined to, we have 20 townships here, but most of it is confined to basically this 17, uh, even uh, 14 township area where we're getting a lot of our calls from. Now I mentioned that we haven't found one positive animal through roadkill collection. And we ultimately have a, a slight skewed uh, data based on female deer compared to male deer. But this data is heavily skewed towards young animals. Uh, well over 70% of the animals that we collect from roadkill are either yearlings or fawns. And obviously at what, as we've heard today or, and yesterday, the older deer, the more mature animals are more likely to have the disease. So this probably has some sort of influence on, on uh, why we're not seeing uh, CWD positive animals picked up with roadkill, but they are contributing a pretty significant load to our sample size. 
So next I'm going to talk about disease surveillance uh, and specifically through our disease control permits. So what are disease control permits as it relates to the state of Michigan? They are free permits to go out and kill a deer. That's it. You get a permit, you go get a sh shoot a deer, and these permits are available typically only to landowners that have about five acres or more, and they're only available obviously in designated disease areas, but they are available 365 days a year. And again, did I mention that they are free? Anybody can use them if you're in that area and you have a landowner uh, and, and, and you can transfer them within the land on the property. We also allow exceptions for hunters to take animals. So we allow them to use uh, high powered center fired rifles, which are not available to be used uh, through hunting season and the firearm season in Southern Michigan. And obviously since these are allowed to be used 365 days a year, they're allowed to be used concurrent with archery season in the summer months when hunting doesn't exist as well. Historically, we require the forfeiture of antlers. Again, this is more of a uh, acceptance uh, policy that we've implemented. Uh, as you can imagine, someone getting a free permit to go out and shoot a very nice deer that they've been watching all summer long on September 30th, right before the hunting season begins, probably wouldn't play very well if we allowed them to keep these 140, 150 inch antlers. So we typically require the forfeiture of antlers uh, when these permits are issued. So looking at sort of a, a Julian calendar of when these are used, it's pretty clear to see that most people are using these essentially as free license during the hunting season. So even though they're available to be used throughout the entirety of, this, of, the, of, the, of the year, they're typically only used from about October 1st to December 31st at about 62%. And obviously you can see uh, the numbers of uses is, is skewed uh, quite liberally towards uh, female deer, 59% of animals tagged on these permits are female deer. Obviously, the, probably the forfeiture of the, the antlers plays a pretty big part of this. So people are essentially using this as a free antlerless license during the season. And then finally, I want to talk about, you know, obviously the importance of our hunters. And, and as you can see, looking at the samples submitted from our hunters, there's no way we can replicate this any other way. We have a wide array of samples coming in from all over our five county area, specifically from hunters. Now, obviously some of this data is skewed a little bit more because this nine township area has been uh, involved in mandatory check a lot longer than some of the other areas. Specifically, we have a state game area up here with public land, uh, which obviously gets a lot of use and, and a lot of deer taken from it. And obviously we've got really good deer habitat over here again. Keep in mind, this is Meridian Township again. Remember where all the dots from the roadkill happen right there? There's very little hunting that occurs in Meridian Township and even west of there in Lansing Township because of the, of the suburban urbanized nature of it. So obviously hunter participation is incredibly valuable simply because you're getting a lot of deer from across a broad area, right? Uh, and that's something that we absolutely need to help detect the, the disease. We also know that older bucks are more likely to be CWD positive. We've heard that yesterday. I think we've probably even heard that today. So looking at the age structure of the male deer that we've tested to date, which technique comes up as the highest one for getting the, the older bucks, um, and that's hunter harvest. The, the roadkill samples, uh, even the, the, the disease control permits, and even the sharpshooters are much more skewed towards fawns and yearlings Whereas 36% of our hunter harvested deer in this, in this uh, five county management zone uh, are two and a half years or older. And obviously a lot more samples are coming from here than any other relative technique. So hunters are immensely important uh, for not only uh, getting a broad uh, scope of samples from across a broad area, but also getting those uh, more at risk individuals. However, this is the concerning part with hunters and uh, we've got a mandatory deer check. In the nine township area in 2015, we had a reported uh, a total harvest of about 1686, which is an estimate that we do have to survey. This is what was submitted for testing. It's about a 72% compliance rate that first year. It's not bad, it's also not great. We're missing one out of every four deer we estimate. We expanded in 2016, and we're only seeing 47% of the deer that we think we should be expecting to see. That's a problem. And let me try to put that into uh, additional details. We've potentially missed, just last year alone, over 2,800 deer harvested from a CWD county area that we do not know where they came from or how they were distributed. 
Um, proportionally speaking, if, if, it, if, if what we missed is exactly what we saw, we missed about 1,500 antler deer, about 1,300 antlerless deer. And the prevalence rate in our core area, and obviously it is very much uh, staggered, we have core, uh, little hot spots. So at the risk of homogenizing you know, a prevalence rate across a broad area, we're seeing about a tenth of a percent prevalence in male, a little less than that in females. We potentially missed almost two positive males and about one female last year just out of our core. And in a state that has what I think we're considering sort of an emergent status yet, this is very critical because if, there are, if they, we did that miss, miss that many positive animals, we don't have any way to know where they are to implement any additional regulations to get our uh, high, high effort uh, intensity surveillance or management in that area. This is obviously a problem that we, we are facing. The reduced compliance, we have no idea what that's due to, whether it's due to the expansion of the, of the core range, whether if we're already experiencing disease fatigue after year one. This is where a human dimensions component would really be valuable. So I want to get back into sharpshooting, which I, I've deemed management of chronic wasting disease. We don't really do this for surveillance. We're not going to utilize our sharpshooters to sort of pick and poke and find it. Um, this is basically what we do when we find a positive animal. Uh, we, we hit it hard. We try to remove those social groups. And as you can see, overall, it only accounts for 15% of our total samples from this 20 township core. But the number of positive animals that we've picked up so far have mostly been attributed to sharpshooters. And ultimately what we're trying to do, and, and this is uh, very similar to sort of Doug's representation or conceptual diagram of what we're trying to do with our sharpshooters, especially in this sort of emergent state. This is the potential risk that we're going to run if we don't implement a rapid response or an intensive response. You find your index animal with CWD, which we know sheds prions into the environment. We also know that its closest relative or neighbor is likely to contract the disease as well. And ultimately, if nothing is done, more and more animals become CWD positive, continuing to shed prions into the environment. Eventually, those deer are going to die, whether it's from CWD or another matter. And ultimately, once they're gone, the, the level of infection with the prions in the environment obviously is greatly enhanced, leaving those naive de deer much more susceptible to, to contracting or, or ex being exposed to the, to the prions. Counter that with what we're trying to accomplish, a, a very aggressive response and, and hopefully getting that early detection. The narrative starts the same, right? But if you can get those animals off the landscape much quicker, the naive animals have a much reduced chance of picking up those prions. It's conceptual in nature, very sort of elementary, but that's ultimately what we're trying to accomplish. Switching now to our Macosta County case uh, and, and sort of captive service overall, I won't go into great detail on this, but uh, late in December of last year, and, and it was confirmed in January of this year, we did have a captive servid producer uh, submit two deer for testing for CWD as part of the, the mandatory program. Two animals came back positive. Um, there's a long story that goes with this that I won't go into because ultimately uh, it's still under investigation and I don't want to get into any trouble. But ultimately what we've established was a nine township area ultimately that we're trying to get about 2,800 deer from uh, over the course of this year and, and hunting season. A lot of this is repeat information from this morning. As of August, this August, we have about 338 registered facilities in the state. Most of those are ranches and breeders. The average size is uh, about 182 acres, but that's a little misleading uh, because it clearly has sort of a bimodal distribution. You've got uh, an average size of the ranch that's well over that, about 440 acres. The average size of breeding farms is about 23 acres. I'll note that there is no minimum size or no maximum density requirements for captive uh, servids in the state of Michigan. And we have about 62,000 acres ultimately behind fence uh, in the state of Michigan. And, and that number has remained relatively consistent over years, even though the number of captive facilities has been reduced uh, substantially over the past 10 to 15 years. We used to have well over 800 facilities in Michigan. Uh, and like I said, we're uh, at about 330, 338, I believe, as of August. I believe this number was also uh, mentioned earlier. 87% uh, of the animals that are privately owned in the state are white-tailed deer, not a surprise. Uh, about 1,600 deer or 7% of the animals are elk, and then you have a, a small amount of a couple other animals. Uh, ultimately, the DNR's part, we're, we're sort of uh, in charge of some of the inventory, and we've had fantastic support uh, getting compliance on inventory returns. 94% of farms 
uh, completed their inventory returns last year, and a three-year average certainly exceeds 90%. Um, keep in mind, though, that the disease testing part is overseen by the Department of Agriculture and outside of DNR uh, scope. Ultimately, I want to sort of go into some of the topics of interest. Um, ultimately, uh, we've got uh, everybody wants to know what the cost of CWD is, and this is for fiscal year 16, 17, and 18. 18 is a projection uh, and probably a low projection now since we just found something in Montcalm County. Uh, I will point out that we have been extremely fortunate to receive two separate $1 million appropriations from our state legislature. That is incredibly helpful and important uh, in helping us do what we can do. I wanted to try to break this cost, uh, this, this money down into cost per deer. And as you can see, uh, obviously taking a uh, number of deer taken by sharpshooters, much higher than some of the other techniques. Um, however, when you look at the number of CWD positive animals removed from the landscape, it all of a sudden starts to become a little bit more palatable and obviously very important. Antler point restrictions probably are one of the most divisive uh, and topical uh, items in deer management today. How we've addressed this in Michigan, in our core area, we've essentially eliminated them. Hunters in Michigan either purchase a deer license or a deer combo license. Um, if so basically choosing between one deer or two deer to hunt for the entire year. Uh, the rest of the state, uh, if you bought that second license or that, that combo license and the restricted tag, you have four points to a side minimum on that second deer. We've eliminated that and we've also allowed uh, the take of antlerless deer on these licenses. In addition to that, the core area, we've unlimited antlerless licenses available and we've had discounted antlerless licenses available. Uh, we discount them 40%. Still with that, over the two years where we've had a mandatory uh, core CWD area, we cannot get hunters to kill more antlerless deer than antler deer. Contrast that with some of the data that Missouri showed, um, where they're taking well over 50%, even 60% of their harvest is antlerless deer. Uh, this not being very effective at reducing our deer herd. Baiting and feeding obviously is a huge issue. We do uh, ban bait in a five county CWD management zone. We also do that for four counties in the northeastern part of Michigan where we have bovine tuberculosis. Elsewhere in the state, we've got a two gallon maximum that can be distributed over a 10 by 10 area. And we also have special exceptions uh, that allow for feeding outside of the season as well. But as you can see, hunters in Michigan like their bait and it's actually gaining support. So overall support for uh, the use of bait has increased from about 38% in 1987 to 71% in 2016. We asked some more in-depth questions last year whether baiting should never be restricted and it's a 50-50 uh, push on answers and whether it should baiting should be banned completely only 14 percent approve of that statement I will show that baiting uh, there is a lot more support for baiting to be regulated when the health of the deer herd is threatened although keep in mind that could mean someone's thinking that deer are hungry during the winter and their health is being compromised not necessarily CWD we've recently enacted a carcass importation ban uh, that just is effective this year that's available to all states and all provinces. So hunters hunting anywhere outside of Michigan are only uh, allowed to bring back the items that I've uh, put on this uh, slide right here. Previously, it was only CWD affected uh, states or provinces. Uh, one of the major impetuses of this uh, change uh, was not only some other states doing it, I know Minnesota's done this recently, but obviously some of the data that's come out of Arkansas as well. So just because a state's considered CWD free, doesn't necessarily mean that it is. We've undertaken a pretty extensive uh, outreach and education campaign. Some of it's very traditional in nature, you know, holding town hall meetings, coffee shop breaks, etc. Uh, but I think we've done some other creative things. We've done the billboard things. We've done some bumper stickers. We've done uh, placemats and placards at certain sportsmen's uh, conventions. And this has done a lot with uh, the help of some of our partners as well. We've also got a pretty extensive social media campaign that we've uh, undertaken as well. So we really try to get the, the word out there. Um, and and we've got, a, we've got a great staff that has done that as well. Uh, we do have some upcoming research uh, over the next year and, and couple years. We've got two separate field studies that will be occurring. One in the Lansing core where obviously we have CWD. Another one that's gonna be occurring in the Upper Peninsula. Obviously these, uh, these are gonna be looking at the movements of deer in those areas ultimately hoping to better uh, define some of these, where these deer are moving from, and that will help uh, provide uh, some better management recommendations moving forward. 
We've also got students modeling high-risk uh, high risk areas, so we can maybe focus on some of these naive areas um, in the state where we don't have CWD, or we can maybe uh, do some surveillance ahead of time to see if, uh, if it is there, and if we do find it, we'll find it a lot earlier, and therefore be a little bit more effective with our response. We also have someone modeling the, uh, the efficacy and sort of influence of our management decisions. Uh, again, all geared towards essentially uh, trying to better improve and, and streamline some of the decisions that we're making as we respond uh, to, this, to this disease. We've also got some folks at the lab working on uh, some prion protein genotyping. I'll leave it at that because otherwise I'm way over my head and I'm out of time, fortunately. So again, I think we're ultimately feel very uh, fortunate with where we're at. Certainly things could be a lot worse, um, but uh, ultimately uh, it's something we're still dealing with. We still want to take a very aggressive approach toward it and uh, we're always looking for additional ways to communicate and, and, and further our uh, advancements on this. So with that, thank you.